So, good afternoon. My name is Grzegorz Kowalczyk. I'm journalist at Business Insider Poland, and I'm honored to moderate the session A View from the Top and Equality Moonshot. Uh, so, global leaders will discuss why and how to change international business in the spirit of equality and diversity. Uh, their commitment sparks a movement and reshaping a landscape of workplaces. Uh, in response to evolving societal needs, we would like, to, we will try to envision a future where uh, so fairness and, and uh, diversity, equality are fundamental pillars, not ideals. So it's my honor to welcome the following guests. Uh, Mrs. Sima Ganvaniwet, chairwoman in Apparel Group. Mrs. Susan Haywood, COO in Exor and chair CNHE. And Mr. Alexander Kutela, CEO Ringer Axel Springer Polska. As you have noticed, our session is attended by leaders from different industries and parts of the world. Therefore, to capture a common perspective, uh, let me start with general one general questions for our our great guests. So uh, now we must face an urgent need to close global gender gap and uh, compounded challenges like. Uh, climate and political crisis. So, um, what is the biggest challenge uh, in equality in the context of business today, and what actions uh, can global leaders take within their industries to expedite progress uh, towards uh, gender equality? Um, firstly, I would address that general question to Mrs. Sima Ganvani Webb, please. Thank you for having me and such an incredible room. I think uh, the ambition in the room has just made it hotter and hotter today. Um, honestly speaking, I just think there's so many things that can be done. Firstly, of course, legislation. Like I was reading a few stats done by the UN and they were saying almost 2.4 billion women still live in countries where they don't have the same rights as men. Like that alone is a starting point for us. But more than that, as far as industries or companies go, I think we need to take a step back. I'm from a family business. And for me, it's so important to see legislation or state legislation that makes it a law that daughters inherit the same way that sons do. Just the fact that that doesn't happen yet leads us to then a domino effect of having less and less women in leadership positions, even if it's a family business. And third of all, I think a very critical factor that I was reading about, which Iceland, Sweden, and I think Finland have done so phenomenally well with, is giving parental leave. It's no longer maternal leave or paternal leave, it's parental leave. This then does not deem the woman as the primary caregiver, which then gives, us her, gives her an opportunity to see the same career trajectory path as a man. So I think these are some of the basic things that I think if they were, well, they're not basic, they're pretty profound, but if they were addressed, we'd see a better, better gap or less of a gap in gender inequality. Thank you. Mrs. Haywood, what's your opinion? What challenges do we have and what actions can we take? Well, we, well, we have many challenges and I, I think you've just outlined some of the things that societies can do to change the position for women and actually all groups which are, uh, which are less represented in the workforce. Uh, from the position of companies, and I work in a number of industries which are traditionally very male dominated. I work in the trucking industry, agriculture, uh, various kind of quite heavy machinery industries which tend to be traditionally kind of relatively male oriented. Uh, for us, it's very important to start by doing something that somebody on the last panel said at the end, which is being very deliberate, being very clear what we're trying to achieve. Uh, in order to do that, you've got to have numbers. Unless you have numbers, unless you actually look at what's happening in your organization, it's just not going to change. And then something else that I think is really important is it's not just about hiring women, and it's not just about putting women into senior posts, it's also about trying to accelerate their careers as they come through the organization, because that's often where they get stuck. And otherwise, what happens is you end up with some women at the top, which is great because they can act as a bit of a role model, but you need that flow of people coming through the organization. I think that's very, very important. Hey, Mr. Kutala, what is your point yeah, of view? So maybe I would like to add a few other challenges. There are many of them, and I know that we, we don't find one which would resolve all of it. 
I would add maybe parallel realities, uh, uh, subconscious bias, and also crisis situations. And let me explain a little bit what I mean by this uh, parallel universities. It's a little bit like a bubbles, which uh, sometimes creates their own reality and their own rules. And here in Davos, we are uh, top leaders. We are a few steps ahead. But in reality, the world outside doesn't look as good and is lacking behind. They would like to share just a quickly a quick story of my daughter, actually. She's a passionate uh, game designer. She um, loves playing games. She's uh, involved in many societies. Uh, but the more uh, given society is anonymous, the less she can really reveal her gender. Because once she do it, she immediately uh, faces rejection, bullying, or attacks. And this is quite surprising because it's young generation. Uh, another example about this uh, subconscious bias. Mm, I think it's here more about the a little bit older generation, which has been grown based on the old patterns. And so uh, we can observe that in case of men, even if we are fully supportive to the uh, gender equality, sometimes subconsciously we can still sabotage certain changes because subconsciously we still refer to the old patterns which uh, we were uh, growing in. But even for women it's interesting, it also can be, uh, can also work because on the other hand, I can observe it uh, from time to time, that women totally believing in uh, gender equality sometimes not fully believe in themselves and their own potential. An interesting study has been conducted in US when um, researchers uh, analyzes uh, reaction for job advertisements, men and women. So if there are, let's say, 10 criteria, men usually apply if they meet just some of them, while women doesn't apply unless they meet all of them. And it's a very good example of this subconscious bias uh, I'm talking about. And maybe a couple sentences about this crisis situations, which we observed, I think, uh, all around the world during the pandemia time, when uh, during the crisis, at least I can refer to Poland in the rural areas, uh, when crisis happened, then men keep their jobs, but many uh, women uh, has to have to give up the job and return to home to take care of the families. And in a way, crisis causes us to coming back to the old patterns, which slows down the, the whole change. So just a few of them, but um, which I can observe from my perspective. Thanks a lot. Mrs. Haywood, you are a leader of steering influential companies, but many industries are still dominated by men. Uh, how to change that? Well, I, I, I mean, the good news is I am starting to see it change. Um, and as we get more women in senior positions, it start, I think it's starting to accelerate. I mean, partly because some of those biases that people have uh, get eroded when people start to see women in positions that they don't expect. Um, I mean, like a lot of women, I've been in meetings where people have assumed that I'm more junior than I actually am or that I'm not doing the role that I'm actually doing uh, because I happen to be the woman in the room. Uh, increasingly, if they do that and that woman is very senior, they're going to end up disadvantaging themselves. And so by having more and more women in senior positions, we are actually starting to create this change. But we have to be, as I said before, we have to be very deliberate about it because it's not just about a few people at the top. It's about bringing more people through. And those of us who are in leadership positions, I think we have an obligation to make sure that we help people coming through the organizations after us. Okay. And Mrs. Ganvanuet, you've built a remarkable business empire, right? So how can your journey inspire uh, other leaders? Uh, to create workplaces where everyone, irrespective of gender, can excel? So, <clears throat> it's, it's, um, it's been quite a journey, right? First of all, I think I owe it to my father to say who taught me that you just never accept a no. No matter what it is, reason it out, find a solution, but you just never accept a no. Thumbs up around the room. <laughs> I think also, all in all, like I, you know, I really look up to women who have trailblazed and done incredible leadership positions, like Indra Nui, who's the ex CEO of Pepsi, and she says women were taught to speak softly and carry a lipstick. <laughs> and I actually don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. I think being authentic 
to who you are and what you believe in is so important in this day and age, especially where everything is either filtered or Insta-ready. So I think if I would say anything, some of the learnings from my journey is don't take no and of course, be authentic. And, and I'll give you an example of that. My, like you were sharing a personal story, I wanna throw my husband under the bus for a minute. <laughs> He, uh, you know, he very amusingly says to me quite often that I will never go on a business trip with you. And I said, why is that? And we've had this discussion over the years. And he says, oh, because you need a proper hotel, a proper bathroom, and it all needs to be proper. And I was like thinking to myself this morning, and I said, the day I can pee standing up, I won't need that anymore. <laughs> So I'm just saying, why shouldn't I be authentic to myself? If I need a proper hotel, a proper bathroom, because of whatever reason, I shouldn't shy away from that. And it shouldn't become a hindrance to traveling with colleagues or with my husband for a business trip. So these are some of the subconscious biases that you talk about, right? We have no clue that we have them, but we do have them. So I just think from my journey, all I can say is that being authentic, being who you are, and not taking no for an answer really goes a long way. I mean, today I employ 22,000 people. So I think it's gone pretty well for me. Man, thanks. Absolutely, I should remember that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Kutela, and what is the media role in that context of equality and not only? Well, obviously, it's critical, yes. Um, uh, media, to a big extent, uh, shape uh, our opinions in many areas. And there is a huge responsibility on us, uh, both in bringing attention to the topic, which still is not, um, I would say, okay, I don't know if we can talk about popularity, but people are still not aware enough about the consequences of lack of this uh, inequality. Um, but also uh, educate, educate in every possible area. And uh, I'm would rather not talk what media should do. I think it's more adequate to tell what we do as a, as a media group, Renewer Axel Springer, and uh, what kind of actions we take, because it pretty much represents uh, what we believe in. So first of all, yes, bringing attention uh, to the topic and uh, mm, this uh, equality. So the challenge is, and our experts calculate that in case of Poland, we need actually almost a sanctuary to talk about truly full gender equality. So it's, it's incredible, but that's, we think that we are very advanced, but we are at the very early stage of the whole transformation. So one of the things which we promote in uh, inviting for the cooperation celebrities and influencers is to really bring attention to the uh, gender uh, equality topic, but also to show that there is a lot of things to do and that we have to accelerate a lot. That's number one. We talked about the stereotypes and uh, that's our another big concern, fighting stereotypes. So I think one of the worst is that there are certain functions, I think you are referring to this, certain functions, certain jobs, which cannot be done by women or the experts are only from the men's side. So we build uh, and promote uh, female specialist, uh, female experts database. And we have over 2000 records of experts, women experts from all the fields, which we actively promote and invite other companies, but especially other media companies, to use this database to invite uh, female experts as a, um, mm, mm, journalists or commentators, uh, sometimes specialists if the company needs to, to change something. And I think it's very important to show that really those experts are everywhere. And uh, another thing which is maybe related to this, mm, and media here, which should be role model, still are not. Uh, which is about the equal voice of women and men, even in media. So I think that all around the world we have problem that this uh, equality doesn't exist yet. And we still have more men-dominated uh, way of communicating and the men point of view is more present in media than, than women. Uh, so we get to the conclusion that unless we really measure it, we will never see the progress. And this was actually great initiatives which originated here from Switzerland uh, called Equal Voice, when uh, Annabella uh, Basler, who is uh, CFO of Rainier, another media company, came with the idea to 
really measure this. And we're using uh, advanced AI model based on the semantic analysis when we actually analyze the share of voice of women and men, making sure that we really change the share. And I must say that since we uh, start to measure it, we can see very visible improvement. Yeah? So this is another great example. And maybe the last thing, which is also, we believe, very important, is fighting with stereotypes not only on, uh, about the women, but also about the men. So I think you mentioned about the role in uh, sharing responsibilities at home. Uh, we believe that we should advocate more for equal parenting and that uh, uh, we actually create another action which we call that at home to promote equal parenting but also promote companies which actively support uh, fathers uh, at, at home. So, so there are just few examples of that. We could talk about this more and more but yes, the role of media is critical and we should be the role model. And what is positive, which I would like to say, is to start or finish with something positive, I can see that many media start to follow the, the, this path. So I am optimistic because it's accelerating. So we have experience from different perspectives and different industries. So I would like to ask, what key performance indicators do you believe best reflect uh, progress in gender equality uh, in the workplace, workplaces, Mrs. Susan Haywood. Well, I, I mentioned at the start that it's very important that organisations track not just who they recruit, but who moves through their organisations and then who they put into positions at more senior levels. And I think it's very, very important in organisations that we have the data on that, that the data is actually quite widely shared, uh, because it tends to be the case that if you have the data and if people are conscious of the data then they will respond to it and they will do things. But if you don't measure it, people don't see it. Um, I'm also very conscious that in big organisations at the moment, it's quite hard to get data that is not gender data. Gender data we can collect. It's quite hard to collect data on other issues. So, for example, one of the things I'm very passionate about is education. Uh, I grew up trapped on a boat for a decade, so I wasn't able to go to school. So one of the things I'm very passionate about, to your point, is education. It's very hard in an organization to work out what the educational backgrounds are of people in the organization. And I think that's one of the big diversity challenges that we need to start to address. But in order to be able to address it, we need to be able to get the data to do it. Mrs. Sima Ganvaluet. So, you know, I was going to say the same point that I think it's really important to understand how many women are we actually promoting? It's very easy to say, yes, I've added this many women to my team. I have hired so many females. But however, how long is a, a woman actually staying stagnant in her position and for how long in your organization? Because we have seen this and we have data as well where a woman's traject a career path is a lot flatter than a man's. So I think that is a clear example of where organizations are actually not, I, I wouldn't say they're deceiving us, but they're actually just trying this game where they keep saying, yes, we've added so many more female employees, but how much are you really promoting them? Like Google, I think, has uh, this wonderful initiative where the bonuses, the executive bonuses are attached to diversity in your team. I think initiatives like that where people are compelled and forced to look at what they're doing within their teams, how they're assessing them, how they're promoting them, all of that I think counts in a large way. Yeah, I totally agree. So uh, basic things like uh, equal salary, promotion rates, uh, workforce balance, this goes without saying. But also what I think is interesting is also to track and observe a uh, level of satisfaction and engage, uh, engagement between women and men, in, especially in the companies. Work-life balance, extremely important, because as we know, it's happened very often that actually uh, women after uh, official job goes back to home and do another 100% job. Um, but even factors like uh, um, all kind of mobbing or harassment, uh, which is genre-based. How does it look like in the company? So I would say that everything which you said, plus those, those two few things are kind of a basic scope of uh, measurements, which we should observe. And today the media are in digital transformation, digital and AI transformation. So does this revolution help in working for equality for, for not? It's a very broad question. 
um, it was a lot of discussions about AI, but maybe I will refer to one aspect. We talk a lot about uh, subconscious bias. Uh, I love psychology, so I believe that subconscious bias is really a big issue, yes, because it's, it's so difficult to fight because we don't even know we follow the pattern. So from that point of view, to search for something positive, I would say that uh, AI-based um, analysis, like uh, the semantic analysis which we are using, can be big support because uh, doesn't follow the subconscious bias. If it's well, if it's well done, uh, we could have much more objective uh, point of view. Yes, so it could definitely be a tool which could help us. Yeah. We have few minutes left, so I would like to to sum up our discussion in, in the, maybe this way: when you see the world in the next decades, and then mm, what do you see in the context of equality? Will it be the success story or not? Maybe Susan. Well, I mean, I'm an optimist, so I hope so. I mean, our our businesses, our planets, everything depends, I think, on getting the best talent into our organisations, and we can't possibly get the best talent if we're ignoring large parts of the potential workforce. So organisations have both, I think, a moral obligation, but also they have a kind of obligation because it makes their businesses better. Because if you don't look at all the potential talent out there, even if it comes in a different form to what you're used to, then you're going to miss out. Uh, and uh, the organizations I work with really do understand that and are doing a lot about it. And so I feel very encouraged by it. I am a natural optimist, I have to say. I do think it will often take longer than we would like, uh, but I think we're moving. And initiatives like uh, this moonshot, I think, are really important. So this particular entire event, right, two years ago, we didn't have this. So the fact that a woman came up with the idea, put it into execution, and now you don't have enough space in the room to accommodate the number of people that want to attend this. So to me, that itself is a testament that there is a movement, and there is a movement, and we all just need to jump on the same ship, jump on the same bandwagon, men and women, and make it happen for your daughters, for our sisters, for our, you know, whoever else is going to come into play. Having said that, I love quotes, and I love this one by this, uh, she's an educator and a political leader, Shirley Chisholm, I think I said it right. She says, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. I mean, how much more brilliant can you get than that? So I just think that there is a movement which was just, we've just got to keep the momentum going and we've just got to make sure that we enroll every single person out there who believes in equality, man and woman. You know, I share all your great advice with my daughters right after the panel, yes? <laughs> I will send them SMS just afterwards. <laughs> it's really great. Um, well, according to the study, we need uh, like exactly 67 years uh, to achieve uh, full real uh, gender equality in Europe and twice longer around the world. So I'm also optimistic. I can't believe we can wait so long. We will not wait so long. We need to accelerate. And as you said, I'm sure that uh, having seen the progress and dynamic, I'm sure we will accelerate a lot now. So I'm sure we will not wait as long as some experts says. So thank you very much for a really exciting discussion. I hope that together we build a better world with, with fairness and, and diversity, of course. At this point, we sh had to finish our debate, but of course, we encourage to continue online. Thank you. Using hashtag Equality Moonshot and tag World Woman Fund. Thank you very much. <laughs>